the more we embrace who we are and, and the kind of sublime states that this state draws us to, the farther away from depression we go. You know, we tend to think that sadness, longing, that these are negative emotions, but you argue that they're hardwired within us to some extent. Yeah, they're part of our emotional landscape. I mean, the fact that we even, uh, well, okay, I guess it makes sense to call them negative, but what we end up doing is not only seeing them as negative, but as seeing them as like emotions that we shouldn't be experiencing that, that we shouldn't be experiencing as opposed to seeing all the emotions as just natural hmm. and you're going to run through different ones at different times and they all have their functions. Wow. So how do we, a lot of people these days are struggling with depression, anxiety, is there, have you sort of uncovered in your research a roadmap to help heal our minds? Well, I think one of the places where we go wrong, um, so, okay, so bittersweetness I define as being a kind of intense awareness of the way that this world is a mix of joy and sorrow and light and dark and, um, and a recognition that everybody we love best is not going to, including ourselves, not going to be here forever. But that what comes with that is this intense joy at the beauty of the world. And what we have found through the research is that that bittersweetness, I think, is on a kind of spectrum where you have bittersweetness here and then you've got anxiety and depression sort of further out on the spectrum. But the more we tell ourselves that we're not allowed to feel the bittersweetness itself, that we're not allowed to admit that this world does comprise impermanence and sorrow and all these things. The more we do that, the more we actually are vulnerable to anxiety and depression because we're telling ourselves that everything we're experiencing isn't real. Wow. And isn't valid. So we should we should actually embrace these feelings that we get sometimes of longing of the grass feeling like it's greener on the other side. Yeah, I don't know if I'd say the grass greener on the other side. Like I, I think that's usually that that usually has more to do with envy and other things like that. Hmm. But more to, but I think that humans are, we're beings who want to tell the truth, right? And the truth is that things happen in this world that are not the way we would wish it to be. And the more we can admit that, the more we can feel grounded hmm. in, in actually who we are and what's happening all around us. And that then paradoxically opens us up to feel more joy and more wonder at the amazing things that also exist out there. Wow. I've heard you talk about um, the the Bible, like the sto the story of of Eden, mm -hmm. and how um, Adam and Eve were thrust out of this utopia, right? Yeah, forever to long for returning to that 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 perfect environment, right? And that's something that's like kind of built into our psyche as humans in a way that almost is, you know, I mean, you could almost argue that that story. I'm not a religious person. I'm sure some people take that as truth, but um, could have come out of the the human condition. Oh, absolutely. I, it's it's really the the center of our emotional DNA to come into this world with a sense of longing for a different world that is better, more perfect, more beautiful than this one. Um, and there's something in that capacity in us to long for for something higher, you know, for a better truth, for more love, all of it that's some of our best selves. And so we see it, we see it in all our religions. You know, it's like the longing for Eden, but it's also um, the longing for Zion and the longing for Mecca. Um, the Sufis call it the longing for the beloved of the soul. Wow. I, I love that way of putting it. And then we have these secular manifestations too, like Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz is longing for somewhere over the rainbow. So this is who we are. We're, we're always wishing for somewhere over the rainbow. And that wish, like, in our sort of go-go culture, we see that wish as being, I don't know, like ineffectual or like mired in like a kind of wallowing. And that's such a misunderstanding of what it actually is. It's like, it's the heart of our creative impulse. Mm. You know, it's the thing that's saying, literally the word longing means like to reach for. Wow. I, I keep making this gesture even as we're talking. So it's, it's about reaching for that which is good and beautiful and true. It's, it's really the best in us. And it brings out in some, I guess, like a, cre a creative impulse. A creative impulse, um, a loving impulse. Uh, yeah, just an, an impulse to perfect. What about, are some people more prone to um, 
I guess, experiencing these feelings than others, because just to use myself as an anecdote, I've always gravitated to uh, what my friends have always mockingly referred to as slit your wrists music. <laughs> like <laughs> me too. Yeah. I've always gravitated to minor key music. I'm and I myself am a musician. That's kind of like the, 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 the types of songs that I write tend to be, they're not happy songs, right? The songs that really get under my skin, give me goosebumps. Yeah. Almost make me feel like I've transcended my own reality are the songs that, that are uncovering some kind of sad truth about the world. Oh yeah, exactly. I actually just got goosebumps now as you were describing your reaction to that kind of music because I have the exact same reaction. And it was actually that, that intense reaction to that kind of music that got me going on this whole quest in the first place wow. to understand bittersweetness. Yeah, because you know this, like when you hear that music, you feel like you're, like, it, like it's a portal to some higher state and I wanted to understand what that was all about. Um, and, and I will tell you, it's not just you and it's not just me. <laughs> like there's actually research out there that shows that, um, that the music that reliably gives people goosebumps and chills is usually the sadder music, like the slower, sadder music. Wow. Um, and people, people who, whose favorite songs are their happy songs listen to them about 100 times on their playlists. But people who listen to the sad songs most listen 800 times. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and to answer your question, is there a certain type of person? It does seem like that. Um, so I have a bittersweet quiz that I developed with the psychologists, Scott Barry Kaufman and David Yadin. And we found that people who score high in bittersweetness also tend to score high on this trait that psychologists call high sensitivity. Um, and that's, that basically means like a tendency to just react really intensely to everything that life has in store. Wow. Like, so, you know, if, if you see a beautiful sunset, you're probably going to react super intensely to it. Um, and if you see like a, a really ugly sight or a terrible noise or whatever, you probably react to that as well. Hmm. And that seems to be correlated with this, this impulse to go into that state you were just describing. It's super interesting. I definitely feel like I'm very sensitive. Mm -hmm. Like I, I've always referred to myself as being aesthetically sensitive, whether it's to music or to visuals. Yeah. Um, that's why I, I mean, I love music. Music is, is to me, one of the greatest things about being alive is, is listening to music that I love and also watching movies. Yeah. So I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm super sensitive. Yeah. Well, it's interesting with that trait of high sensitivity, sensitive people aren't necessarily super sensitive to everything. Hmm. There's usually like a few dom domains that they're super, that they particularly react to. Um, so I'm like you, I'm like aesthetically sensitive also. I, I totally get what you're saying. I love that. Even like yeah. beautiful architecture. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect weather. I'm yeah. sensitive to, I'm like, I, I love it. You know, like I just, it gets under my skin. Because I share this love of, of this kind of music that you're describing. I actually dedicated my whole book to Leonard Cohen. I don't wow. know if you love him the way I do, but I do. he's like my patron saint. Oh, he's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Why did you dedicate it to Leonard Cohen specifically? Well, okay. So, I mean, all my life I've loved his music. I could never understand exactly why. And sometimes with music, you don't really ask. You just love it. And that's that. But when I started writing this book, um, I really started like digging deep into his philosophy. And I realized like what is underpinning all of his music. So he's like, he, he's the embodiment of the state of longing that we were just talking about, you know, the longing for Eden, Zion, Mecca, whatever it is. Um, and he, so he was a real seeker. And one of the places that he went was into the Kabbalah and he had this life philosophy um, that was based on one of the parables uh, in the Kabbalah. And the, and the idea of this is that all of life was originally, um, all of creation was originally a divine and intact vessel that then shattered at some point. And so that the world that we're living in now is like the world after that breakage. Mm. Um, so it's a broken world. And that's why he sings about the broken hallelujah um, in that song, hallelujah, that so many people love. That, that's like what it's about. But the idea is that in this post-breakage world, scattered all around us are still the, the shards of that divine vessel. 
So mm-hmm. there's like shards of light scattered all over the place. Reminders of how perfect like life could be. Yeah, yeah. But also like a suggestion of how we could actually live, um, which is to say like you're going to notice different shards of light from the ones that I'm going to notice. Mm. But for each of us, when we notice them, the job is to like bend down and pick them up and do something with them. And I love this vision because it's not, it's not promising a utopia that's never going to come. It's like acknowledging the pain that's in the world, but also acknowledging the, the beauty of it and like turning us in the direction of that beauty, even as we're telling the truth about what the world is. Wow. Because some people are just like not, I guess, less aware of the, of, yeah, of what, you know, I guess some people just kind of navigate life in, in, a, in a state that's somewhat less self-aware, less sensitive. And so it takes artists like Leonard Cohen to, I guess, unearth um, these emotions in people. Yeah, and I, I do think that what artists are doing sometimes for us, somebody like a Leonard Cohen, they're telling us, you know, what you feel in, at your deepest core, we all feel that. It's not just you, you know, and I, I, the artist, I'm going to like put myself out there and tell you that I feel it and that everyone who loves this music also feels it. Um, and I'm going to do this extra service of turning it into something beautiful. Um, you know, the, the phrase toxic positivity has become a kind of cliche in the last couple of years. And there's a reason for that cliche. I mean, we're living in a culture that tells us not to think about this aspect of life even though for many people, they, they feel it very deeply. That's true. So what do you think about, so what, what's the deal with toxic positivity? First of all, what is that for people who are unfamiliar with that term? Yeah, it's, it's basically um, the idea that no matter what is happening, you should be just like unfailingly upbeat, optimistic, cheerful, chipper. Um, and that should be your default mood and your, your constant mood. Yeah. Yeah. On social and social media does, a, I think, a pretty good job of, of promoting that. Right. Because it's like when you go to somebody's Instagram feed, it's, it's like a highlight reel of their life. I mean, people tend not to post with as much frequency the negative stuff, the negative emotions that they're feeling. Right. Right. And even if they do, you know, it's all like packaged up in a specific way. Yeah. Usually <laughs> highly um, curated. It's highly curated. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and but this has been with us. I would say social media has made it obviously much worse in the, in the last 10 years or so. Um, but this has been with us for a while, like all the way into the 19th century. You can see how our culture started to adopt this idea. Um, I mean, it was basically because as we became more and more of a business culture in the 19th century, um, people really started focusing on whether you were a success or a failure hmm. at business and like whether you were a winner or a loser. and and. And whereas in the past, it used to be thought that if you had bad luck in life, that was because like the goddess of misfortune had frowned upon you and there's nothing you could do about it. Now it came to be seen that if good or bad things happened to you, it was because of something inside you. And the more we look at it that way, um, the more people want to have nothing to do with the emotions that could be associated with being a quote loser. Wow. So like anything that has to do with loss and longing, vulnerability and awareness of impermanence, you know, all of it is like, oh no, I, I don't want to go there. That would be like, that's like on the loser side of, of the ledger. Hmm. And, and so we came like in the 19th century, there was this turn. Um, like psychologists actually noticed it, that people got to a point where they didn't even want to comment on bad weather outside because wow. that would be seen as not cheerful enough. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's really the legacy that we're still living with. Is that why people then is that why people tend to gravitate to like tabloid uh, publications and gossip to to you know where, for example, celebrities are taken down and people people love to see others getting canceled on social media these days. Is it sort of like this extreme reaction? to toxic positivity that like there's this talk that we, we tend to live in a world where everybody is, is, uh, overly, you know, overly positive. And then it's created this equal and opposite reaction where there's this like vitriol and, 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 and toxicity at the other end of the spectrum, right? The, the rise of cancel culture. Yeah. Do you see those as being connected in any way? 
That's a really interesting idea. I mean, I guess the way I see it is that we are okay with any emotions that we think of as being connected with like what I was calling that winner side of the ledger Mm -hmm. and the righteous outrage that has become such a a big force in our culture. That's, I think that's an an emotion that people associate with power. Hmm. Um, So like, like with the ancient Greeks, there were like, they saw humans as having four primary emotional states. So one was the bittersweet sort of melancholy state that my book is about. Um, one is anger, which they called uh, being choleric. One was being super cheerful. That was being sanguine. And then the other was calm. And that they called that phlegmatic. So basically in our culture, we're only comfortable with two of those four emotional states, like the cheerful one and the angry one. Mm. And, uh, and the cheerful and the angry one are ones are the two that social media like amplifies. Right. <laughs> and like, it's like a really narrow lean. Um, I would say until social media came along, we were more just firmly in the cheerful one. But now like we've opened up this sort of Pandora's box of outrage. Wow. So how can we how can we use the insights that you have uncovered and, and write about in Bittersweet to increase happiness, right? Because ultimately, I think that's what we want to do. And I'm not saying that we want to uh, numb ourselves to to these bittersweet feelings. Because again, like I actually derive a lot of joy. Totally. Right? From from those emotions. But um, but yeah, so how do we then like sort of reconcile, right? Like, because on the one hand, it's, an, it's a negative emotion-ish, right? It's not always pleasant, right? F- the feeling of longing for, you know, another life um but uh but yeah at the end but at the end of the day i think we we are now in a time where people have serious mental health challenges and um so how can we how can we use these insights to increase i guess the overall area under the curve for happiness well i guess i want to come back to something you said right at the beginning of that question where you said and now i don't remember the exact words you used but something about how you derive a lot of joy um, from these emotions and I feel this way, and a lot of people feel this way too. And in fact, I almost called this book The Happiness of Melancholy hmm. because, because it can be such a happy state. It's not classical happiness. It's, it's something else. It's more like a, a feeling of, of connection with, with what matters most. Um, so the first thing I would say is for people who experience that state to embrace it and not to be afraid of it. Like I, I've heard from a lot of people who have read the book who, who tell me, <clears throat> excuse me, that when they would get into that state, like one, one guy who's a, a filmmaker here in LA wrote me a letter and he said he had always privately called that state to him, to, to himself, that holy feeling, wow. even though he's not a religious person, but that's how he experienced it. But he said for years, he denied himself access to that state because he had also separately experienced depression. And he assumed that being in the state that you and I are now talking about would lead him more to his depressive side. Hmm. When in fact, the opposite may be true, that the more we embrace like, who we are and, and the kind of sublime states that this state draws us to, the farther away from depression we go. So a, a lot of it is just is being able to lean into deep emotional states, whatever they happen to be, and to embrace those. I love it. I feel, I feel like there's a difference, though. Like I get I derive a lot of joy from listening to the slit your wrists music <laughs> and from watching movies that are <clears throat> as uh, one of my favorite directors, Cameron Crowe, likes to call happy, sad, yeah, you know, the happy, yeah. sad. Um <clears throat> types of, of, of themes in storytelling. But on the other hand, it's real like when I'm actually longing for say my mom, right. you know, who passed away three years ago or yeah. a past failed relationship. Yeah. Those are not quite as joyful. Like, it, you know, I'm not, I wouldn't say that those moments are moments of joy necessarily. Oh, I totally agree <laughs> with you. Totally agree. Um, I guess what I would say with those moments is to, they're not going to be moments of joy, but 
there are moments of love. Like when you are longing for your mom who's passed, that's a moment of intense love. So you, you obviously don't want to be so deep into that emotion that you can't like live your life. Right. But you can live your life and carry the love with you. Um, instead of like, I, I think for many people, they might feel like, oh, my God, that emotion's so painful. So I'm just not ever going to go there. A hundred percent. It's like the themes that that was what was, I think, explored in that movie, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Right. Yeah, I didn't see that one. Oh, man. Well, basically, in a nutshell, it, it poses this question to the audience. Like you could either. You could either. Sit with those emotions. Right. And and. um and and have those intermittent feelings of longing right but but with the longing you also get the memory of of love you get the feeling of love right mm -hmm. like it's a net positive to have had that experience it's better to have loved right it's better to have loved and lost than to have never loved at all right but then the other the alternative option that's posed in that movie is like well we could wipe your brain free of it all right right like we can right. just we can just uh extricate you from that entire experience so you'll never have to think about it again and I think the protagonist in that movie, at first, he thinks that that's the better option, right? I'd rather just like not think about my ex-girlfriend at all ever again. I'd rather, you know, clear the memory of of my mom because it's just too painful to to, to long, right? Yeah. Um, but uh, I mean, it's an old movie, so I don't feel bad about about kind of giving away the <laughs> the um what the conclusion is. But I think ultimately. And people should de definitely still go check it out. But ultimately, I think what's revealed is that we don't want to wipe our memories clean of those moments. It's better to long. It's better to have loved and lost at the end of the day. Yeah. And I guess what I'd say also, that phrase, it's better to have loved and lost, that phrase kind of implies that, well, it's better because at least in the past, you've experienced love. It's like all past looking. But I would, and, and that's true, but I would say there's another dimension to all this that has to do with the future, which is, and I'm, I'm, okay, I'm thinking here of this branch of therapy. It's called um, acceptance and commitment therapy that I learned about when I was researching the book. It comes from this guy, this guy named Stephen Hayes. And he basically teaches that when you have a painful experience, like the one you're talking about with your mom, um, to first of all, go through a first step of like accepting those emotions for what they are and knowing that sometimes you're going to be overwhelmed by them and that's all natural. Um, but, but it's called acceptance and commitment therapy. And the commitment part is the insight that, um, that we should ask ourselves when something is super painful to us, well, it's basically telling us what we value most because it wouldn't be painful. Your ex-girlfriend wouldn't be painful. The memory of your ex-girlfriend wouldn't be painful to you if you didn't value love so much. And so it's basically telling you in your pain lies the signpost to that which you value. Hmm. And then you can commit in your life to moving in the direction of what you value most. So like the two things you just told me, you just told me about your mom and your <laughs> ex-girlfriend. It's like, okay, like this is a person who really values love. Yeah. Like, that's just what came right out. And so now there's a way to know that and orient your life in that direction, even if it's going to be painful. I, I, I feel like it's, it doesn't take a fortune teller to, to look into your future and know that it's going to be full of love because you've just said how much love matters to you. Oh, so much. You're right. That's comforting to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's comforting. And then, and then like the commitment part is like to really take steps to move in that direction, you know, to find the love that you're looking for. Yeah. So do we, is, is one of the reasons why, I mean, we, why love is so important is because it provides a sense that there's a possibility that we might return to this utopia, this garden of Eden. Cause you know, it's like, um, there's that whole Freudian concept, right? Like we leave the womb yeah, and then, we just life is just struggle until we somehow are able to forge a communion with somebody else um a significant other and then it's it's it, it provides a sense at least momentarily but ideally 
it's an enduring sense that we've somehow returned to that state. Yeah. I, I, I love it that you asked that question. I, I've been, I was asking that question of myself the entire time I was writing this book and, and really wrote a lot about that. Wow. Um, the way I see it, the conclusion I've come to, like I, I spent all these years looking at all these different wisdom traditions and, and um, what psychologists have to say about all this. I see all of these as manifestations of the same state. So, you know, like psychology speaks the language of, or psychoanalytic speaks the language of, this is all about the wish to return to the womb, as you were just saying, you know, and religion will say, well, this is all about the wish to reunite with the divine or to return to that divine nature. Um, you know, and an artist might say, well, this is all about the wish to achieve a perfect beauty. I think they're all the same thing. They're just different languages yeah. for expressing the same state. Um, I think an yeah. artist also, uh, whether they're, they're conscious of it or not, they seek to attain immortality through their work, mm -hmm. right? To be able to create the piece that's going to transcend their own short little lifespan. Right, right. Right. Like the, the book that endures or the, the, the film, you know, like the, that, that endures lifetimes, not yeah, just, not just yeah. a single lifetime. Right. But it's transcend, but it, it's transcending and becoming immortal through the achievement of some higher state of value. Right. Cause otherwise it wouldn't transcend it in the first place. So it's like, I don't know, like the, the ancient Greeks had this word potos, P-O-T-H-O-S, which basically meant like the, the state of longing for a perfect truth, perfect beauty that was unattainable on this earth. Whoa. But, but it was seen as that it, that state, that potos, that longing was understood to be the thing that catalyzed us to take our adventures in the first place. Wow. Yeah, like like Ulysses in 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 Homer's Odyssey. The idea is he he only went on his whole adventure because he was so longing with homesickness for his native land of Ithaca. So like the poem starts with him weeping on a beach for his homeland. And because he needs to get to the homeland so desperately, that's what set that's what sets him off on the adventure. Like that's what makes the epic poetry happen. So that's fascinating. Yeah, it's it, it's it's like, know, like once you understand that yeah. about yourself in the world, it it really shifts your relationship to your life decisions. How I, I mean, everything everything ultimately comes back to love, right? Like the like we're just everything. We're we're just yeah we're so individually as a species, it's the it's the drive to find love really. Right. To 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 find communion. Yeah. To plug yourself into something that feels immortal. If only for a, a moment. An immortal love. Yeah. An immortal I, love. I think that's right. I mean, that's how I see it, too. Um, I actually in the book spent a bit of time exploring Sufism, which is the mystical version of Islam. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the reason I was so drawn to it is because the Sufis talk about the longing for like the way they, the way they characterize the divine is the beloved of the soul. Hmm. Is that Rumi? Rumi was like, yeah, Rumi was a great Sufi poet. Hmm. Yeah. Like from the 12th century. So what, what have, what do they have to teach? Well, they basically, they talk about this state of longing and the idea, like what Rumi says in poem after poem, after poem, he's like, be thirsty. You, know, you want to be thirsty. You want to be in that state. Um, because, the more you go into that state, the closer you get to the love that you seek or wow. to the divine that you seek. Wow. So, yeah. I, so to me, these are like these, these truths and these superpowers that have been known for centuries and you see them in every culture and in every religion. And in modern day culture, when does anyone ever talk about this? Like this, it's such a fundamental truth that is not told to us. Yeah. And I feel like when people, when people do feel these emotions, when they allow themselves to feel them, the first impulse is to want to numb them, right? To, to, yeah. to drink yeah. those feelings away or to place, you know, our attention elsewhere yeah. on, on, on other distractions. I'll tell you another Rumi poem 
that I love. I'm not going to remember the words completely, but but it's basically this poem where um, it's called Love Dogs. And it's about a man who is praying to Allah. And then a cynic comes along and says, you know, what are you praying for? Did you ever get any kind of answer? And the man is like, no, actually, I never did. So he stops praying and he falls into a kind of fitful sleep. And then um, and then Hidr comes along. Hidr is the guide of souls. Mm. And he asks the man, why did you stop praying? And the man explains why. And, and Hidr says to him, oh, and here's where I wish I had the exact words, but he's, he's basically saying the longing that you have is the return message. That is the return message from the divine, the longing itself. Wow. And that the grief you cry out from is what draws you toward union. Wow. So powerful. I wish it was a more comfortable emotion to feel, but um, but I guess it's not not designed to be as such. It's not it's not meant to be as such. But well, I'll give you a more like earthly way to to get more comfortable with it when we're talking about grief, because I feel like that's really when when you're when you're talking about how uncomfortable it is. I feel like you're talking about grief itself. That's fair, yeah. Um, so one of the best ways I've seen of thinking about grief comes from Nora McInerney. She's a writer and she has a, a podcast also called Terrible Thanks for Asking. Hmm. Um, so she experienced, she, she lost her husband, her beloved husband, very early on in their marriage. And so she spent a lot of time thinking about grief. Um, and she's now remarried happily. And she came up with this way to think of it to make, make a distinction between moving on and moving forward. Because like our culture is basically telling us, you know, move on, which is like, get over it. Yeah. You know, like even when we say let it go, which is in many ways a lovely idea, mm. in those lovely words, there's even there embedded the idea of like, get over it. You know, no. It's time, it's time. Um, and she's saying, don't do that. Instead, move forward with it, which means... You carry the lost beloved person with you. You carry the grief with you for as long as you're feeling it. And you're moving forward with your life, wow. bringing that person along with you. So she's happily remarried and she says she wouldn't have the marriage that she now has without what her husband meant to her and still means to her. Wow. He, he's still part of it all. Wow. I love that. So... So don't try to move on. Yeah, I think that that reframing is really powerful. Yeah, like with your mom. Like I'm sure your mom is with you in a thousand different ways still. Yeah. Like the grief for her, but and and also your mom herself. Mhm. Mm You're carrying her with you everywhere you go. Yeah, absolutely. I think it can be trickier to do that with like past relationships. Um because those people are still around walking around <laughs> right having new relationships and that yeah. kind of thing yeah yeah but um but obviously when somebody passes they're they're taken from you and um and i think it's a but that wow that is a that is a powerful insight i would say even with past relationships the person's still around moving forward with their life you're moving forward with your life the relationship you had is still intact and that is still carried with you yeah. and shaping you and influencing you in whatever you become. Yeah. And I think like you, you, you all will all continue to have relationship with that person. It's just in a different way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. Therapy has helped. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's do different cultures and different languages have, have, uh, are there different ways that, that, um, different cultures deal with these kinds of feelings because there's actually, there was this uh, Portuguese term. Saudade. Yeah, yeah, I was just going to bring it up. I was literally just Googling it um, because it's so powerful. When I, when I heard it for the first time, maybe a decade ago, it was something that, it was like a term that just like really got under my skin. And it made me realize how language is so important. The, 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 the languaging that we use to describe these feelings. And so, sometimes language can be inadequate, inadequate. Yeah. Um, and so we have to look to other languages where they do it, where that, where occasionally they do a better job of, uh, of talking about these feelings. Right. Like, um, I was, uh, 
I posted on Instagram the other day about how odd I think it is to hear people refer to their significant others as their partners. Mm -hmm. To me, it feels very clinical, business, right? depersonalized. Yeah, I get but, that. But, um, but a lot of people responded in saying that when they're in, um, and I hadn't previously considered this, when they're in very long relationships, but they're unmarried, boyfriend, girlfriend feels inadequate, mm -hmm. feels too casual. Yeah. And they're not yet, they're not husband and wife. So partner feels like the natural sort of intermediary. But that term I feel like is insufficient. And, and then other, some other DMs that I got um, alerted me to the fact that there's, uh, in, in other languages, there are words that are better suited, right? Oh, interesting. What are those other words? I don't remember the, I don't remember the words. I think there was like a Swedish word. Or I, I, I just think like sometimes English fails, right? To, to really capture a feeling. Yeah, absolutely. Um, appropriately. And so going back to saudage, um, that's one of those words that there's no English word. There's no, you know, that, that, that perfectly, uh, describes the feeling that that word does. So I don't know, maybe you could talk about that. Yeah, bit. absolutely. Okay. I'm going to talk about this Sodaji word, but first, um, the thing about partner, I, I, I hadn't thought of that, but I totally agree with you. The yeah. minute you say it, I'm like, yes. It's um, so weird feel... when people introduce them. I mean, there are, I think, different reasons, right? Like uh, some in the LGBT community will use it because it just like, it saves having to have a whole conversation about sexuality and stuff. But that's an aside. I think like um, the, yeah, the, the, the way that um, people use it um, to describe that intermediary kind of relationship between boyfriend and girlfriend and husband and wife it exposes like a truth about language that sometimes language is, ina is inadequate and we suffer as a result. You know, you're so right. I'm actually feeling like the word that would make more sense and it would sound, it would sound kind of sappy with our current culture, but, but it's probably the right word is like my love. Yeah. That would be the right way to talk about it. Yeah. I mean, but, I, th I think like my significant other, my better half, Mm -hmm. are all better than partner. To me, partner sounds weird. Yeah, no, I, <laughs> I, I, I know exactly what you mean. Um, okay, and then for the Sodaji word, yeah, it's really interesting. There's a lot of cultures and languages that do have words for it. So Sodaji, that, that's a, the Portuguese word. Um, and it basically means kind of like what we've been talking about. It's like the, the longing for a lost person or experience with the understanding embedded in the word that that person or experience may never have existed in the first place. Hmm. So it's more like just this state of longing for it. Or they're that, never coming back. Or they're it never com is how coming back. It, yeah. it can mean all those different things. Um, and Brazilian music is like so imbued with Sodaje. Oh my God. And, and, and Portuguese too, like the whole musical genre of Fado. It's all about Sodaje. Like, and, and Fado is this, this genre that came from like, the Portuguese women looking out to sea for their lost husbands who were often sailors hmm. and hoping that they would come back. And, and this musical genre of Fado was said to express that emotional wow. state. Um, yeah. And then in Welsh, there's a word that I have no idea how to pronounce, but it's something like hera et. Um, and then English, you're right. Like we don't have a good one. So C.S. Lewis, who was deep into the state and talked about the inconsolable longing for we know not what, he ended up using the German word, which was Sensucht. I may be mispronouncing it. But basically, there are all these different cultures that talk about the state and that have words for it that we right now are lacking. Yeah, it's, a, it's such a problem. <laughs> I know. Because, I mean, language is so important, right? And, um, and when we... When, when there ceases to be a, an adequate word to describe a feeling, I feel like it leaves us uh, feeling a bit ungrounded. Yeah. And when you go to Portugal, that word, sodaje, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. Like there are pastry shops called sodaje. There's like, you know, bars called sodaje. It's, it's like, wow. it's so, it's so much the essence of the culture and everybody knows what it is. And it's just part of everyday life. Like you and I are having this discussion about this state of mind. And it's like, we have to spend all this time defining what the heck it even is. Yeah. But I think if you went to Lisbon, it would be a really different conversation because it's just part of things. Fascinating. Yeah. That's so cool. Why did you, why did you write bittersweet? 
I mean, I really did start down this whole path because of this reaction that I've had all my life to this music, um, which I just understood deep down, like that it was more than just that surface question, you know, cause the question of, well, why do I like sad music? You wouldn't write a whole book and spend seven years talking about it. I just instinctively sense that it was getting at something much deeper. Um, and once I saw that, I, I really wanted to open that up hmm. in our culture. Cause I, I think also, so our culture is so divided right now. And I believe that if we could get to a place where we could just more openly share our sorrows and longings in a way where it wasn't considered such a big deal, that would be one of the best ways we could find of connecting with each other, like across red and blue and everything for people to just share their stories without it being attached to any policy prescription or any political agenda or whatever it is, just, just tell your stories, the, the sorrows, especially because, because humans are evolutionarily designed to respond to other beings sorrows. Hmm. Um, like we think of that as a Sunday school thing, you know, compassion, but it's actually built into us. Um, and this is something that Darwin noticed from the very beginning. Like he was really struck by how on the one hand we had this propensity to sort of cruelty and violence, but we also had this instinct and other mammals have it too, to just like react instinctively when you see someone else in despair, like you, you feel despair yourself. Wow. Um, and he actually traced it ultimately to just the fact that we're mammals and that the only way our species survive is by us being able to take care of really vulnerable babies mm. who cry in order to tell us <laughs> that we should do something about it. Um, but that caregiving impulse kind of radiates outward from there. Um, and so today we know like with, with modern science, um, this guy, Dacher Keltner at Berkeley did these studies where he shows that our compassionate instinct is connected to the biggest nerve centers in our body, like the, the vagus nerve, which controls our breathing and our digestion. Your vagus nerve also reacts when you see another being in a state of distress. Wow. So it's like, it's fundamental to who we are. And yet we're living in a culture that says, you shouldn't really be talking about those things. And if you do, it's somehow suspect or not cool, or it's like something you're doing gain unfair sympathy or, or something like that. We need a, a place where these things are just part of everyday life. Mm. Yeah. It's like the basis of, of empathy. Exactly. Really? Exactly. Yeah. I'm super sensitive to seeing other people, um, suffer. Uh, but even if they're not necessarily suffering, like I get, you know, just seeing, um, people who look decrepit, Mm -hmm. uh whether it's due to old age or poor health it's just something that like really makes me sad um and 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 like this the sensation of like my heart like re you know wanting to reach out and like and connect that's probably why i do what i do you know in in some subconscious way it's because i you know, i'm so uh affected by the suffering of others and cause to me, I mean, it reminds me it's, it's probably something that predated what, what I experienced with my mom, but it reminds me of my mom, um, and, and all the suffering that she endured. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, I think empathy, empathy is so important and, and you're right. We, our society is sort of organized now in a way and, and social media feeds the beast, but it's, it's organized in a way that where empathy has been all but wrung out from the conversation right we've become so polarized so so polarized and politicized and i mean the fact that, that we even had to bring up like politics like in this conversation everybody has become politicized today it's so weird yeah you know yeah. i'm i'm aware of politics and i'm the least political i'm i'm I've, i would have always described myself as being apolitical like i don't care about politics i went on a tv show recently that uh, I just went on to spread my message, like to, to help people. Like, I don't care what side of the aisle a person is on. If they're willing to listen to what I have to say, 
I, that's it. That's all I care about. And, uh, and some people like mo- most of my followers were completely supportive and amazing, but there were, there was a very small minority of people that, um, unfollowed me and even unfriended me on my personal Facebook because I went on this show. That's like a, a political show, mm-hmm. you know, which I w- I'm happy to do. Mm-hmm. It's about the message, not the platform. Right. 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 It's just, uh, it's, it's so sad that that's what we've sort of become. Yeah. And I, I guess I'm thinking what we need is um, some kind of a social media platform where it's just about telling true stories. And maybe the platform has to happen anonymously. I'm not sure um, for people to really do it without all the self-presentation and all that other stuff. Yeah. Um, But just to tell the stories. All the peacocking. All the peacocking. Yeah. All the outrage, all of that. Um, Shoot. There was something I was just going to tell you. I want to know, like, uh, I'm sure it'll come to you, but like, what was surprising? Like, what was most surprising um, when doing the research for this book and writing it? Like, was there anything that um, that you uncovered that was like really like more mind blowing than um, than sort of everything else? I'm going to answer that question in a second, but I just remembered what I wanted to tell you before. Is that okay? Yeah, of course. Yeah, just that. I was just really struck in the way that you just described like this snippet from your life. You know, you said something like, well, this is part of why I do what I do. And and that was connected to you describing, you know, the physical heart opening sensation that you get. Mm -hmm. That's actually like a really big deal. The fact that those emotions are connected to your whole life's work. So I, I just think people should be paying attention to that much more, you know, and like, and, and to follow to follow those emotions. Like the through line. To to follow the through line. Yeah. Yeah. And that, again, that like the places you feel pain are actually also signposts to what you care about most. Mm. That's, that's what that idea from Stephen Hayes's acceptance and commitment therapy. That's a huge idea. What is that about? I don't, I'm not familiar. Oh, that's what I was describing before. You know, the idea that you like the, when you feel a pain, you should be paying attention to it because it's telling you yeah. what you value most. Yeah. Um, yeah. Human suffering is oh, an animal suffering. I'm just, I'm very sensitive to it because my mom was very sensitive mm-hmm. to suffering. I mean, she was more, I think, interested in animals and people, but, um, but yeah, I, uh, is when I, whenever I see, you know, somebody, um, that reminds me of, my mom, somebody frail, decrepit. Um, it really gets to my core. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, uh, and it's hard for me not to want to be like, you know, uh, like a martyr mother Teresa type, but then, but then I connect it back to like what I, what I do, which is ultimately about helping people and it all makes perfect sense. Yeah. And you're trying to prevent people from getting to that space in the first place. 100%. Right. I mean, that's what we were talking about before we even started taping. Yeah. That was the first thing I asked you about because yeah. my mom suffers from dementia too. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's what it's all about for me. So I'm grateful that I get to do this. But would you have would you have done this work if you hadn't lost your mom? Or if uh, or let's if your mom hadn't gone through dementia? The, dementia, yeah. No, I don't know what I'd be doing. Um, I mean, I, I've, I've always been in, in media, but when my mom got sick um, at a young age, it, yeah, it propelled me in, in like a way that I hadn't previously experienced. I mean, it was like a, the most powerful call to action I'd, I'd ever experienced. It was like the hero's journey. You know, I just yeah. going with my mom to all the, the doctor's offices and experiencing what I've come to call diagnose and adios with her and just seeing the, the dearth of effective treatments. Um, it really made me, it made me realize that prevention was important. And despite the fact that I wasn't a medical doctor, wasn't a PhD in nutrition, I felt empowered and entitled to answers. And, um, and I, and I felt compelled to teach what I was learning. So, and it was because of, and it, it was, yeah, it was because of what I was, what I was seeing with my mom, that the only, that the, that it's just, you know, it's, it's so hard to see the person that you love most in the world, um, go through that. And that there's an, that there's the, that the possibility of an alternative to that 
um, and that that alternative may be um, found in our, you know, or, or attained via the choices that we make with our diets, with our lifestyles. To me, that was a really powerful idea and something that I couldn't keep to myself. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's part of what this whole bittersweet tradition that I've been reading about, like across all these cultures and centuries, that's part of what it's teaching. You know, like uh, the way I put it in the book is whatever pain you can't get rid of, make that your creative offering. Mm. And I feel like that's what you're doing. That's yeah. what you're describing. And, and humans, we're such, we need meaning so much that this is what we do naturally. So it's like after 9-11, there were suddenly lots of people signing up for jobs as firefighters. Wow. And after the pandemic, we've had an increase in medical and nursing school applications. So it's like there, there's this thing in us that takes a calamity hmm. and wants to turn it into something else. Wow. And wants to, to make a meaning out of it. And this is why we can't be like ignoring this aspect of ourselves. This is why I say it's some of our best selves. Um, are located right there. Absolutely. I, um, this is actually not, uh, the, like my, my work with health and nutrition isn't the first time I've taken, uh, uh, personal pain and, and, and transmuted it. I don't know if that's the right word, uh, sort of funneled it into something, um, creative and artful when I, um, broke up when I went through a breakup with, uh, this ex-girlfriend who I, um, was on and off with for a very long time, but the initial sort of phase of, of the relationship, um, it was very painful. And, uh, I had always wanted to be a musician. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was unable to actually write songs until I went through this breakup. And then it, it, it created this sort of, it led to this like Cambrian explosion of, of creativity for me. Mm -hmm. And I started writing all these songs that I was like unable to, I was unable to write music. Um, I just thought it was like not something that I was able to do, you know? And then I, I, I was writing song after song after song. They were just like flowing out of me. And it was a way for me to take this, like this pain that I experienced for the first time, actually, because, you know, growing up, like, I think we all have we all, we all have trauma, right? Like from, from our childhoods. And for some people it's uh, big T trauma. For some people it's little T trauma. I had little T trauma. Like mm -hmm. I, I had a very good, very good childhood. Nonetheless, we all have, you know, tra experiences that, that traumatize us. Um, but there, I really didn't have anything to draw from. I felt like from a, from an artistic standpoint until I went through this breakup mm -hmm. and, um, I started writing all these songs and, uh, and so, yeah, that, that was like, to me, that was just like a, a really important, um, an important, I think, moment in my life where I, uh, I realized that that's, A, I realized that I was an artist, um, but also that you can, that, that, through, that through art and creativity, you can take something that's painful and, um, and turn it into something beautiful. Actually, one of the song, one of my original songs that I wrote, which is, people can Google it. Uh, it's called Weather Advisory. And one of the, the, the chorus in that song is uh, that calamity will somehow be poetry. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. When you said the word calamity, it made me think of that, yeah. that lyric. Oh, but, I really want to hear that song. Yeah. Um, that, that there is a, that there is, you know, even, even with the worst of experiences, you know, there's, there, there, if you look for it, there usually is a silver lining to be found. So every single thing that you're describing about that creative experience is like straight out of all the research on creativity. It's wow. Yeah. I, I have a whole chapter in the book on it. It's like, it's so fascinating. Like <laughs> I hardly know where to start. Um, like many of the most creative people, uh, this, this one study found were orphaned when they were in childhood, like an astonishing percentage. I forget what it is, like something like 50%. <clears throat> excuse me, I'm not remembering the exact number, but lost one or both parents before they were 18 years old. Wow. Um, and then there was this other study that showed people different movies. Like some people saw happy movies, some saw sad movies, and some saw bittersweet movies like Father of the Bride. 
And the people who saw the bittersweet movies, oh, and then afterwards they had to perform some kind of creative task. Mm. And the people who saw the bittersweet movies were the most creative. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. There's just like study after study like this, but it's a really interesting and delicate balance because people can take from that, that there's um, some kind of glamour to depression itself, whereas depression is actually really bad for creativity. Mm. Depression is more like, you know, emotional black hole from which it's really hard for anything to emerge. And that's really different from the state you're describing of the longing for your ex-girlfriend that, that put you into your creative music making state. It did. Yeah. I mean, it, w- would you describe it as depression or was it something else? No, it wasn't depression. Right. It was. Um, I mean, it, it wasn't like a it's not a happy feel. It's not a positive emotion, but. It's, um, yeah, it's not a pot, it's, but it's not, it's not depression either. Depression is like, yeah, it's an unmotivated state. I was motivated. Right. Depression is like, you don't want to get out of bed. Right. You don't want to eat. Right. Right. You feel worthless, valueless, like all of that. So, and you can't produce something valuable from a state of feeling without value. Right. It's like a contradiction. Right. Yeah. So therein lies how melan you know melancholy and um and the, these bittersweet feelings can actually be can be can be harnessed in a way. Yeah, and I think that when they come, like, like that's one of the things you can do at least when they come is know that there's there's something fertile in there. Yeah, um, it's not always fun, but it's at least fertile. I, uh, I I actually I remember that my father my my father and my brother both passed away of COVID, um and. Sorry. The, oh, thank you. Um, yeah, and during the, particularly the days right after when I was like reeling, I remember feeling like whatever I write down now is going to be the real thing. And if I try to write it down later, it won't come out with the same depth. And um, and so I just sat down and wrote. And, and it, that was helpful and cathartic in and of itself, but it's also like, what you produce when you're in those states is completely different from what you have access to when you're in a more level state of mind. A hundred percent. It's like a night and day difference. Yep. And you can't really. Yeah. And it's so intense when you're in it that you think you'll always have access to it, but you don't, you don't, it, it, it vaporizes. It's, I know. And these, it's these, these, these kinds of moments, experiences, life is peppered with them. So it's, I think one really, I mean, there's so many important takeaways from, to be had from this conversation, but to try to remind yourself to, um, to, to harness, uh, you know, those, the, the, those emotions that you're feeling for something, um, for something creative. Yeah. Like to turn it into something beautiful. That's yeah. the way I think of it. Yeah. Whether it's like, creating a collage or writing or making music from it or um what have you i think that that's like or it could be some act of service like what you're doing mm. with with trying to help people with their diets yeah yeah i mean i feel like this the podcast and my books they're all they all as as scientific as it can all be sometimes it's very much rooted in in art for me Mm -hmm. yeah no i can tell i can tell yeah like it is an artistic expression even though it's like i talk about you know (laughs) nutrients and things like that it's very it's very much i feel like a a, it serves an artistic purpose for me yeah i think that's important for people to know because we tend to have like a really limited way of talking about art in our culture right so like people hear creativity and they're like well you know, I'm not a painter, I'm not right. a writer, I'm not a musician, so this discussion has nothing to do with me. And right. that's not the right way to be thinking of it. No, you're so right. You can Creativity can, can take so many different shapes. We have this, like, yeah, very limited way of thinking about it. But if you're a programmer, you know, you, I'm sure you're creative with your code. Um, if you're a mom, there's, you know, I'm sure you can find ways of, uh, of infusing your, your, your day-to-day with creativity. It's not just this like, you know, painting or writing or, or what have you. Right, right. Yeah, no, it's actually even funny that it gets reduced to just these few pursuits. I don't know why we think of it that way. So true. 
Hey, if you liked that video, you need to check out this one here and I'll see you there. You know, as much as we like to believe that willpower is a real thing and that we just don't have enough of it, if you look from a neuroscience perspective, that's not actually what drives the brain. So that's the first thing I would say is don't rely on your willpower.